Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. And welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida, wherever you may be and wherever you may be listening from. You can catch us every Tuesday on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any platform that you're listening to this. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe and share this or any of the great episodes with somebody who needs to hear it. I have a very special guest on today with us. It's Mr. Louis Aguirre from Miami, our hometown guy. Welcome, Louis. Thank you, Sergio. A pleasure to be on. All right. So Louis is an anchor and reporter at WPLG Local 10 in South Florida. He recently returned to South Florida two years ago after co-hosting the nationally syndicated Emmy-nominated entertainment magazine TV show, The Insider. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. So Louis is a two-time Emmy award-winning television journalist who first gained national prominence as a correspondent for Extra. Joined The Insider from Miami's Fox affiliate WSVN in September 2014. He began at WSVN in 2003, where he served as the entertainment correspondent for Seven News and co-anchor of Deco Drive, Miami's number one entertainment show. In addition to reporting on entertainment news, he has guest starred on hit shows such as Sex in the City, Jag, Burn Notice, Guiding Light, All My Children, and others. A native of Miami, uh, Louis attended the University of Miami, the U, and the Université de Paris. A la Sorbonne. Did I pronounce gotta, that right? We got to work on your French, brother. <laughs> L'Université de Paris la Sorbonne. Uh, d'accord, d'accord. D'accord. On his free time, he enjoys spending time at the beach with his two rescue dogs, which are gorgeous. He's also involved in many local charities and advocates for the Humane Society and Best Friends Animal Society. A starch defender of the planet, Aguirre is passionate about using his voice and his platform to create awareness about environmental issues. Welcome, my friend. Wow, you should be my press agent. That was really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm available. I'm available, man. <laughs> nice job. Thank you, Sergio. Nice intro. Thank, Thank you, you. And I love your Christmas tree in the background. Merry Christmas to everybody. And Merry happy Christmas. Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> All of that good stuff. Happy Hanukkah. Happy yeah. everything. Happy love. Exactly. Exactly. It's been a it's been a tough year, but uh, it's we're we're gonna finish strong here in 2020 with a lot of, uh, you know, looking forward to the future and and all the good things are going to come. So Louis, you are a a hometown guy, Cuban descent. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing here and kind of what was life like for you growing up, you know, in the, in the early years? Well, I mean, um, I'm first generation. So both my parents were born in Cuba. They met and married here. Um, I was born, um, when my parents lived in a little house by, the Dade County Auditorium, and then we moved to Wichita. Hey, <laughs> all right, Wichita. Proud to call house. it yeah. home right now. Proud yeah, to call it home of the game in your studio, Wichita. Yeah, well, I went to Coral Park <laughs> Elementary, and that was, you know, you know the hood because that's yeah. where you are right now. Right? That's where so, my daughter goes to school. That's yeah. right. So we were kind of in the same hood, and then my parents moved to South Miami, and that's where I did my, you know, my formative years, and then I moved uh, to Paris. That was my first uh, venture outside of Miami. I did two semesters abroad at the University of La Sorbonne and um, and then came back to Miami and then moved to New York. Um, so it was a really beautiful childhood. It was very insulated. My parents were obviously conservative Cuban. Um, they joined the big five as all good Cuban parents did in the <laughs> 1970s and that's where I hung out and uh, made friends and was social. And uh, I went to Belen Jesuit Prep, as you said. And so my, my childhood was very heavily curated. And it wasn't until I went to school uh, later on in life at the University of Miami and then later on when I went to Europe that I really uh, learned to discover who it was that I am. And all of that is very formative, obviously. But you really learn to express who it is you really are when you begin to take steps away from home. But all of that serves you. And so I am blessed that I've had beautiful parents and a beautiful extended family that has shown me nothing but love and encouragement. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that's, I guess all those different, um, spices and, and ingredients made the man that I am right now. 
Was it clear to you growing up that this is what you wanted to aspire to be? Did you want to be on the news, you know, in, in I, these entertainment shows? What was it about that? I knew that I wanted to be in the spotlight. I was a very, believe it or not, I was a very introverted kid until you put me on stage. And so um, I was very involved with any kind of school production. I, I played the Wizard in The Wizard of Oz. I played uh, Count Penny Pincher in a play called King Puddinghead. So anytime you could put me in, on stage, I, this little shy kid would just break out of his shell. Otherwise, I was extremely introverted and I would spend time writing stories and writing books, picture books. So I knew that I wanted to be a storyteller and whether it be uh, telling a story on stage or writing or putting together a book, I knew that um, I had a gift for telling stories that I was creative and, and that I would channel my gifts that way. I thought I wanted to be an actor and that's where I put my, um, my, my efforts and focus um, in coming out of high school. My parents dissuaded me saying that it was a very tough career um, that I would uh, fall down and get bruised up a lot and they would prefer that I would major in something a little bit more stable and that I should get a law degree just in case. So uh, the broadcast <laughs> degree was, was, a, was a way of kind of doing both and I still took some performance classes at the University of Miami. Uh, but going to France really broadened my horizons and it made me a citizen of the planet. It made me realize that there were more important stories to tell than just the scripted stories. And so um, I, I committed to that. and. Um, I was very involved at that time. The University of Miami had one of the first operational cable studios, it still does, uh, in the nation. And so we were able to not just use the studio to learn uh, the trade, but also produce television shows. So I was involved in every TV show you can possibly get, except the sports show, because I wasn't very athletic. But anyway, I did the news show, I did the public affairs show. We, we produced our own campus soap opera called Passions. It was really bad, I hope <laughs> it never shows up on YouTube. I'll never Sorry. live it down. Yeah, yeah. but um, so I knew that I, I love the medium and I, and I loved uh, to tell stories uh, using a television camera. Um, and so that just kind of, it, it, it kind of pushed me in that direction. And I think life shows you the path. You just have to commit to it when it shows your way. And I think it would have hit my head against the wall had I become an actor at a young age. And I attempted that when I left, when I finished the University of Miami, I moved to New York City. I tried my stint at modeling for a little while and I was meeting casting directors and it just didn't go my way. And the forces of the universe brought me back to Miami a year after I spent a year having a great time and partying my ass off in New York. And life brought me back to Miami. And as fate would have it, I got my first job on television at Channel 51 Telemundo, uh, reporting in Spanish. Uh, and the Spanish that I spoke was with Jetta Spanish, which is not the kind of Spanish you speak on television. <laughs> so I would stay up with my Cuban grandmother until two o'clock in the morning, got a rest her soul, and she would read the newspaper out loud with me and she would correct my Spanish until I could learn to speak Spanish well enough to be on television. And even then, God bless Mirna Sonora, the news director, and Alfredo Duran, the general manager of Channel 51 Telemundo. If you're out there watching this, I love you and I owe everything to both of you who took a chance on this 21-year-old kid who was definitely wet behind the ears. I couldn't even speak Spanish properly. And they gave me my first shot on television. And um, I couldn't go live. They would not let me go live uh, <laughs> because you had no idea the things that would come out of my mouth. As a matter of fact, before I said anything on camera, I would have to call in my script. Uh, my anchor at the time was Alina Mayoase, who is now the anchor at Univision and is my sister-in-law. That's another story. Oh, uh, yeah, our siblings wound up getting married. Crazy story. Uh, but she was my mentor and she would help me dramatically uh, produce my pieces uh, for air and make sure that I didn't say anything crazy on air, which I did several times but anyway. Uh, but that was the beginning of everything. And so I owe a lot to uh, those people who believed in me and gave me a shot. Now, early on, you you had a sense of following your breadcrumbs, the clues that uh, in life that said, hey, listen, this is something important. This is where you feel good. This is where you shine because you're an introverted person. Uh, but somehow when you got in front of the camera, it just flourished right and so yeah. you ended to follow these breadcrumbs in you know during your career you've faced a lot of obstacles and adversity right because it, it is a tough career to 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 go into and you are going to receive a lot of no's I'm, I'm sure and disappointments before you re, you know you, you reach the you know the pinnacle tell me about how you face those things how you get over that so you can get back on you know on the horse and and achieve what you want to achieve. I want to talk to the young people out there because, and, and I, I say this because I just hang out with my incredible nephews 
One is at Georgetown. The other one is at the University of Michigan. They're both stellar students. One graduated from Columbus, the other one from Berlin, and it's their first semester away. And it's been a weird semester, obviously, because of COVID. And uh, they've attempted in-person learning, and then they've had to shut things down. Then they had to come back to Miami and, and do online learning. So I took them for a day on the beach on Saturday, and we hung out, just us, you know, the fellas. And um, they were talking to me about all the disappointments they were facing, and I was having this very same discussion with them. And I was remember feeling their age and feeling so cocky when you're 20 years old and you think you graduated high school, you think you know everything, you don't know anything. Yeah. You know, so you go out into the world. And I remember moving to New York City, thinking that, oh God, I went to the University of Miami. I have this great tape, which not a lot of people have. All of the wonderful work, which was really not, um, working at the campus, you know, television station, and I had these great headshots, and I was going to be a model, and I was going to be an actor, and all this was going to happen just because out. I had it all planned out. And I got to New York, and New York literally kicked the shit out of me. Uh, and it was a wonder. I had a wonderful year in New York. I worked all kinds of odd jobs. I made no money. But I lived in a great apartment. I got in, somehow I got myself invited to all these great parties. Um, would be invited to dinners that I didn't have to pay for. Would find a way to pay, you know, ten dollars, ten dollars for a theater ticket. And and life kind of took care of you. So when you trust that life will take care of you, it does. And I learned that at a very young age. So that was my first my first clue that I didn't have all the answers, and that if I allowed life to steer me in the direction that it wanted to that I would be well taken care of. And I never freaked out. And, and this is something that um, that kept playing out in life. So um, New York didn't work out. I didn't get a job. I mean, I got jobs. I was a waiter. I worked as a, you know, as a as an assistant for a model agent um, and did all kinds of odd jobs in New York. But I never did anything meaningful that would launch me into my career. Uh, so when the opportunity came to come back to Miami after just blindly sending out tapes and thinking that I was going to get a job in a small town like Fort Myers or somewhere in you know Iowa, or because that's how you start in television. You start in small markets and you work your way up. The last thing I expected was to get my first job in television in Miami. And the last thing I expected was to be doing it in Spanish. But sure <laughs> enough, that's the path that opened up and I committed to it. I didn't say no. I wasn't intimidated by the fact that this was a Spanish language job, that I didn't feel confident in my Spanish. Um, and so, you know, I did it. And then when I was there for a year and I learned the trade, I wanted to move on. Um, and um, I was offered a job to work for uh, a brand new project called TV Marti, which was uh, like uh, um, uh, Radio Marti and um, uh, oh, the, I forget the name of the radio that, that beams to all of the uh, um, consulates and uh, naval and, and, and uh, military bases. Oh, Radio Free America. Sorry. Okay. Um, it was along the lines of, of that where it was going to be the first television show, unbiased television show that would beam uh, a broadcast signal to Cuba so that they would let the people of Cuba know what was going on in the world. And it was a very exciting time because the Berlin Wall had just fallen and communism, as wow. we knew it, around the world was crumbling. And so my first assignment was actually go to Berlin and to cover, you know, the fall of the wall and the reunification of East and West Germany. I was a punk kid. I was 22 years old. I had no idea what I was doing, but I took the job. I had producers that had worked with me in Telemundo who had made the job and were producing for TV Marti. And so they took me with them. All was set good. I got a great apartment in Georgetown. I was set. It was my first like real big TV job. And, and then sure enough, six months into the gig, I, it, I was told that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. And I was like, oh my God, I've committed to this. I've moved my entire life here to Washington, DC. I've got this apartment that I now have to pay for. I've got a car payment. What am I going to do? Um, and as fate should have it, a month later, all those tapes that I had sent out, the news director at Channel 10, where I am right now, called me and said, I just saw your tape. I'm the new news director here. I was looking over some old tapes that were sent to the old news director. You've got a great look. You've got a great vibe for Miami. I want to bring you back. How can I convince you to leave your job, <laughs> leave my job, <laughs> very easily, <laughs> and come back to Miami? And I said, "Well, <laughs> what do you got to offer?" You know, no, but seriously, uh, his name was Bob Richbloom, and again, I was a kid. I was 22 years old. 20, I just turned. 20, I was going to turn 23. I had no idea what I was doing. I basically did not even earn my stripes. I spent a year at Telemundo uh, learning television and learning how to practice my Spanish. 
And then I spent six weeks in Washington, D.C., a week in, in Berlin covering this international, incredible, historic story. But I knew nothing. And again, I was given this opportunity to come here and, and cut my teeth. And you either sink or swim. You know, sure. uh, Oprah has a great saying, and I, I'm a disciple of Oprah. She says, luck is what happens when opportunity meets preparation. Yeah. And so that door opens for all of us. How prepared are we when that door opens? How committed are we to walk through that door when that door opens? Because that door will open for all of us. Every single person what's watching this right now that thinks, oh, I don't have what it takes, or this only happens to the lucky people, or I, I probably win the lottery before I get my dream job, that's BS. Mm -hmm. You don't know when that door is gonna open, and you don't know that that door may lead to another door, but that door, that opportunity, will open for everyone. How prepared are you when that opportunity comes your way? Ah, that will decide your success. And, and if you believe in yourself. Right, and having the courage to walk through that door. Having the courage, absolutely. Because you don't actually know what's on the other side of that, right? You never do, no. The other side is, you know, out of your comfort zone and it does, you know, take some risk and some vulnerability to get yourself out there. Like you said, you didn't, you weren't polished on your Spanish, but you said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get at it. I'm going to figure out how to, how to be polished and how to make it work and, and yeah. go for it. And yeah, I'm still polishing it, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> you never stop polishing. Yeah. That's right. And you work on your craft. And so you everything work on your craft. happens. I love the saying that everything that happens uh, to you happens for you. Yeah. Right? Because it's how we perceive events. This year has been very difficult for a lot of people, but it's also put people in a lot of position to flourish. We've been able to spend more time with our family, look at what, what's really important in life. And so perspective- You're echoing me right now. This is exactly the same conversation yeah. I was having with my nephews this weekend over the beach. Okay. I, I said to them, life is not about what happens to you. It's about how you react to what happens to you. So perception is everything. Yes, 2020, without question, has been the most challenging year. I think of my entire lifetime, of the lifetime of many of the people that are probably watching this right now, of our generation, um, for so many reasons, and not just the pandemic, but obviously we're living in a powder keg uh, of political times right now, of uh, racial unrest right now. There's a lot of things that are happening socially, politically, and obviously the pandemic plays a big part in where we are. But it's part of the evolution of the species. There's an evolution of consciousness that's happening right now on the planet. And evolution is, is growth, and growth is pain. And sometimes to be able to grow, we got to get through the pain. But depending on how you see what is coming up for you every single day, that will curate your experience. If you wake up in the morning uh, and all you see is doom and gloom, I've lost my job, I'm gonna lose my job, uh, I'm gonna lose my business, um, I'm gonna get sick, my parents are gonna get sick, uh, this is a hoax, this is not real, the government is trying to suppress my freedoms, that will curate your experience. Now, I'm not saying that life isn't gonna happen, life is gonna happen, but all of us have the opportunity to see that either as an opportunity or as something that's going to bring us down. And so that exists for each and every one of us. Perception is everything. How you choose to see whatever is showing up in your life will curate your experience. Um, I, I got COVID. I, you know, I, I tested positive at the beginning of the summer uh, along with 10 of my colleagues. Um, I never came down with a symptom, not a single. I saw all of my colleagues go down, four of them intensively in the hospital. Two of them quite literally fighting for their lives, but I never gave into it. And, and um, obviously, yes, there's a lot of physiological reasons for this as well. I'm an O positive uh, blood type. Uh, I take very good care of myself. I'm, I'm mostly a vegan, uh, if not vegetarian. I'll eat fish every once in a while. Uh, I have a very strong spiritual life. Uh, I begin each day with meditation. I do things that feed my soul each and every day. So all of that plays a part, but I never gave into the drama or the narrative of being COVID positive. I never experienced any of the symptoms. And I think that mindset has a lot to do with it. Again, you know, the viral load that I was probably exposed to was probably minimal, but that was my experience because in my mind, that was always gonna be my experience. And so I believe a lot in, in what we think we create um, and that's always served me and it's gotten to me to where I am and it's still the way that I live my life. Exactly. I, I, I love that because we, we think very much alike. We all got it as well. My wife, myself, my two kids. And I was telling her that, listen, you can't think about this as, oh my God, who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to end up in the hospital. I'm going to end up on a ventilator. No, no, no. You got to think about this. Like a, it's just a cold. It's a flu. I'm going to get by it. Now, of course, 
you know, everybody reacts differently, but I think there's a huge mental, you know, kind of mind body that is going to then steer you in a certain direction, you know, one way or the other. hundred percent. You know, and again, I think a strong spiritual life is key. I think, uh, and whatever that means to you, I'm not, it's not about religion. Religion is one thing. Spirituality is, I think if the world were more spiritual, it'd be a much better place because religion is very divisive. Um, and I, you know, I, I was born and, um, uh, baptized and raised Catholic, and I love my religion, but my my religious life and my spiritual life are two different things. Uh, my my religion is the way that I, that I sometimes choose to express my spirituality, but my spirituality is expressed in every single, in a myriad of ways. Um, and so I begin each moment just centering myself and just you know having that communion with God, with Spirit, and and I let set that set the tone for the day. So I think if if you have that presence in your life, if you if you allow yourself, uh, and and it's available to all of us, it really you know it, it seems so out of reach and it seems so complicated, but it's not. It really is just flipping a switch. You can flip a switch and instantly be connected to spirit, be connected to God, however you choose to you know to to call it Creator, God, Yahweh, um, Allah, whatever. Uh, it's all the same, um, but. It's, it's a switch, and, and God is always there for us. God is always present. We're never not connected to God. And if you live your life with that confidence, knowing that you are connected to God, then, then if God is perfect, then, then we are perfect, and there is nothing that is imperfect. And if that is your, your driving force, then there's nothing to fear, and you are ready for whatever life serves you. Uh, and that's, I think, what got me through every single challenge, every bump in the road, including testing positive for COVID at the beginning of the summer. We're on with Louis Aguirre, anchor WPLG Channel 10 and two-time MU Award winner. Um, so tell me about your morning ritual. I know that starting off the day is incredibly important because we set the tone for how we're going to approach the day, how we're going to face the day. What is your routine? What, what, what do you do to, that works? So um, I'll tell you what didn't work for me. Um, especially starting out as a young professional is that you, you know, the alarm and depending on the show and I've done every schedule uh, you could possibly have in this crazy industry we call television. I've done morning shows. I've done late night. I've done, you know, regular nine to five shows. The tendency that we have in this three dimensional material world that we live in is as soon as the alarm clock goes off, we hit the ground running. We get in the shower, we turn on the TV, we answer emails, we answer texts, we turn on the coffee machine, uh, and we scramble out the door and get ready to get on with whatever the day has to hold, um, which I think is a huge mistake. Um, and 15 years ago, I discovered meditation um, and it changed my life. Um, it, it's something that told me to slow down, to take a breath and to take care of myself and my soul before I took care of the things that I thought I needed to do um, for my job, for my partner, for anybody else in my life. If I didn't take care of me first and my soul and my heart first, then I was going to be no good to anybody else the rest of the day. So that, um, I, be, I, I began to see my life change. When I gave myself that moment, uh, when I first started the day, before I tackled anything else, things started to fall into place. I wasn't getting into conflicts that much at work anymore. When conflicts arose, I didn't let my passion and my temper get away from me. Uh, when problems happened to me, I was able to take a breath and see things from a different perspective and not go down the rabbit hole, not go down the wormhole. Um, so because I saw the, benefit, ben, ben, the, the benefits of that and I saw things happen in my life, materialize, like things manifesting in my life that I've always wanted to make happen, um, I said, oh, wow, I'm really doing this. There's something to this. This really works. And so I begin each morning um, with uh, a, a, a 30 to 40 minute meditation, um, sometimes an hour, depending. I mean, the actual meditation is about 20 minutes. I, I'm, I practice TM, Transcendental Meditation. And, um, if you know TM, you do 20 minutes of meditation, and you have a two minute of waking up uh, period after you come out of meditation. But then I think it's very important for me to journal when I come out of meditation and I write down things that either come up in meditation or I write down five things every day that I'm grateful for. So I begin each day with meditation and gratitude. That is. <laughs> yeah. there, there is, there is nothing that interferes with that, you know, um, that is non-negotiable. Uh, and, and I usually begin the meditation by reading something spiritual to kind of inspire me. And so depending on what I'm reading, it'll take me 
you know, 20 minutes before I begin meditating, but it's always something that feeds my soul first thing in the morning. Before I feed my body, I feed my soul, number one. And then after I'm done with my meditation and I'm feeling great and I'm ready to, you know, tackle. The great thing about meditation also is that it erases, it's like, it's like an eraser on a chalkboard. No matter what drama you experienced the day before, you start the day with a clean right. slate. You're opening yourself up to new possibilities, to new narratives, meeting new people, experiencing new things, new opportunities come your way. And so already, uh, you know, I'm beginning the day clean with a clean slate. And so I continue to find ways to feed my soul. You know, if I have to answer an email, I will or I'll, I'll answer a quick text. But then the next thing I do is I walk my dog to the beach. I'm a blessed man. I live 15 minutes away from the beach walking, you know. And so, you know, a lot of people don't have that. But we can go outside and commune with nature, take a walk in the park, take a walk around the block. But I think it's very important to have that connection with nature, whatever that means to you. And so that's another you know, way that I feed my soul before I tackle the day. And then it becomes about, you know, what do I have to do? And, and usually on the way back from the beach, if I can, I'm not too distracted. I'm really focused on the dogs. But if there's a phone call that happens that I need to take or if there's a, a meeting that I have to take, but I try not to schedule anything, which is why we're doing this at 11 o'clock in the morning and not earlier, if need be, before 10 o'clock, because that morning hour is very sa it's sacred to me. That is my church. So I go to this people, people are talking about, you know, churches closing down for COVID. Yes, but the churches, wherever you make your church, you going to the beach, that could be your church. You know, church is a state of mind. So that morning, I go to church every day. That's what I say. You know, I, I go to the church of my of my soul in the morning when I meditate. And then I go to the church of nature when I'm done with that. And then I'm ready to take on the day, whatever comes my way. Um, and I think it's very important to set the tone that way. And then after that, then I do things like go to the gym, I get dressed for work. I'm obviously connected on on uh, Twitter and watching the uh, cable news uh, network so that I'm prepared because preparation is everything right. before you go into the studio and you want to know what's going on in the world. If you're going to tell the people what's going on in the world. That's basically my day. I'm in the studio. I get to the studio between 2, 2.30. I do my first show at 3.30. Um, and then I'm done with my day because I'm also, if I'm not anchoring the 11 o'clock, I'm contributing to the 11 o'clock. So I'm usually wrapped about 1130, come home around midnight. It takes me a good half hour to an hour to decompress. So I'm up to about one o'clock in the morning, 1.30. And then I go to sleep and the day begins all over again. Do you ever, it sounds amazing. And I, and everybody thinks that exactly, that, that's what I'm going to start doing tomorrow. <laughs> they do it for a week and, and they kind of fall off the train, whether it be, you know, work or they wake up late or they're tired or they're kids. Do you ever fall off that, that rarely, schedule? rarely. So, so, um, and, and obviously I've, I've had teachers that have helped me through, like, uh, I said with a guy named Light Watkins, who's got a great book and he's going to kill me. I forgot the name, but you can Google his name, Light Watkins. He was my meditation teacher in California, but I only started studying with light, you know, four years ago. Um, and so I was doing this on my own. I taught myself how to meditate just by, you know, um, listening to people on, on talk shows or watching YouTube videos. There's a great app on your phone called calm. Sure. Um, and that's one of them. There are several others and you begin with five minutes. Med all meditation is, it just, it just stops the mind. So you stop yourself from thinking because your mind it could be your your own worst enemy. You can mine f yourself out of situations because you think right. you're not ready, you're not talented, you're not good enough. So your mind will play tricks on you. So if you shut down the dialogue inside your head, then you leave yourself open to what can be. You leave yourself open to the possibilities of of the day and of life and of experience. And so when you meditate, what you do is you shut down the dialogue. And you do that by either some people focus on their breath. I have a mantra that helps me, um, you know, shut down the dialogue, the voices in my head. And then you have that those perfect moments of stillness when you're connected to 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 God and you feel the presence of God all around you. Um, and it's a beautiful moment. And you never quite know how long that lasts, um, but it doesn't matter if it lasts 30 seconds or it lasts 20 minutes because time is irrelevant. You know, that's another conversation for a deeper conversation. Yeah. But, you know, our, our notion of time is, 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 is a human thing. It's a human attribute. It's not, it's not a universal attribute. So, uh, you know, 30 seconds is really a lifetime um, in the grand scheme of things. 
Sure. The, 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 the point is to just quiet your mind. And some people begin doing it by two minutes a day, three minutes a day. Some people meditate and don't even know that they're doing it. They wake up in the morning and are quiet for 10 minutes without turning on. The, the worst thing you can do first thing in the morning is turn on the TV. And the worst thing you can do is go to bed watching uh, news or something depressing or violent before you go to bed. Because all right. of that just sets the tone for your sleep and it's then it sets the tone broken. for the rest of your day. You know, so, um, yeah, so when I fall off, if, if something is happening and I've overslept for, for or, or, you know, uh, I'm late for something in the morning, I make up that time later on. You know, I, I, when you practice TM, you're supposed to meditate twice a day, once in the morning and then find, uh, find a time four to six hours after your first meditation to meditate again. And it's only 20 minute sessions. You're in and out. Um, and so that's my challenge is to find those 20 minutes later on in the day. I, I'm not always successful with the 20 minutes later on in the day. Obviously, I work in a very fast-paced industry sure. where I have to be on and available should news break. So I really can't break away from that. But in the morning, I find those 20 minutes. And on those days when I, I don't, for whatever reason, I make up the time later on. Now, that's now because I've been doing it for 15 years. But at the beginning, yeah, I would fall off all the time. But, you know, you fall off, you pick yourself up, and you start all over again. There's no right or wrong way to doing it. The only question is to do it. So and be consistent with it enough to so that it becomes sure. hard not to do yeah. it. To do it. It becomes routine, and then you and then you can't even imagine your life without it. Really. So as we wrap this up, this has been a fascinating conversation. I always ask my guests: Has there been a time in your life, or an event that has occurred, or something that happened that it was a game changer in your life that really snapped something in your mind that you really triggered the you know your career took off, your thinking changed. Was there a defining moment or, uh, or or point in your life where you had that game changing moment, that aha? Uh, yeah, I've had a lot of them, and and all of the aha moments have come from nature. So uh, uh, whether it be like uh, the recent series I did on on the fish kill that happened in Biscayne Bay and shining a spotlight on the fact that our bay is dying, that if we don't act now, we will lose Biscayne Bay, we will lose our quality of life here in South Florida. That to me kind of cemented that I made the right choice to come back to Miami and, and take this job. Uh, but before that, I knew that that was always gonna be my course because everything that happened to me in life was connected to nature. When I was at The Insider, you know, and I worked in Hollywood for three years, I went there to go to the Oscars, to work a red carpet, to meet all these famous people, maybe jumpstart my acting career, you know, get discovered by Spielberg or, uh, you know, or Nolan, you know, be the next Batman, I don't know. Uh, yeah. But then what, what the, the greatest thing that happened to me when I was in Los Angeles was Discovery Channel invited me to go and do Shark Week with them, not just once, but twice. And, you know, and I went to Tahiti and I dove with sharks. I came face to face with a tiger shark, a 17 foot wow. tiger shark without a cage. That's a life changing without moment. You realize that the fear that you've had of these animals is has been biased on by by film and by and by television. And you realize that they truly are magnificent creatures that need to be respected. And you have to know how to react when you come face to face with a tiger shark. But the fear that I have, I love, I love sharks now. I'm an advocate for sharks now. But the seed was planted when I was 40 years old. I grew up as a kid. Um, one of my favorite shows was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You're probably too young to know about. You're too young to know about the show. <laughs> but it, it, it was the show that went on before the Wonderful World of Disney. Yeah. And so I thought I wanted to watch Disney because as a kid, you want to watch Mickey Mouse and all of the characters that you love and. But the show that I really found myself attracted to was this great show uh, that uh, every day would take you to, every episode would take you to Africa. And there'd be these incredible adventures. You'd see a pride of lions sure. hunting, you know, a zebra, whatever it was. And so I knew from a young age that I wanted to go to Africa. And I made a mental note that by the time I turned 40, I would go to Africa. And 40 came around and I didn't go to Africa, but um, it was at, at that same time that I started to meditate. And one of the first lessons that, that you, that when you when you learn that your thoughts control your your narrative, you you create this vision board. And so I created this vision board. I started cutting out pictures of a safari, I, lions and giraffes and elephants, and I had this all over my office at Channel Seven at Deco Drive. You'd walk into my office and it looked like some crazy collage uh, had just exploded all over the walls. But most of it was was things that reinforced this dream of mine to go to Africa. And sure enough, seven months after my fortieth birthday. A friend of mine said that she was just gifted this safari in Africa, and she had no idea that I was, you know, it was my dream to go there. Yeah. 
And she goes, I've got this, this free trip to two for Africa, but I don't know who to take on this. I'm like, you don't know who to take? You're taking me. And that was like, seriously, it was the craziest thing. It was like three months after I started like pasting pictures on my wall of putting it giraffes out and elephants and tigers and lions and monkeys. And all of a sudden, three months later, I'm going to Africa. But the, the game changing moment for me came when I got to Africa and I was meditating uh, and I opened my eyes. And you know about this kind of, you know, the theory of this, you know about this intellectually, you know, they're all connected. We're all made up of stardust mm -hmm. and the, the molecules that make up the human being are the same molecules that makes up the blade of grass that make up, you know, the ant that makes up the, the rat that makes up the dog, the cat, everything, all of life is connected. We're all made up of the same molecules, right? So, you know, this intellectually, you know, this scientifically. When I woke up from that meditation in Africa and I was completely sober, there was no hallucinogenics at all involved in any of this. It was just completely just having a beautiful spiritual moment. I woke up from that meditation. I looked around and I felt connected to all of life. It was literally, you know, Amazing. that Lion King moment that, you know, <laughs> Simba. I mean, I was Simba right there. And I felt connected to the circle of life. And it was the most amazing moment that I've never been able to replicate ever in my life. But it was just this wow. connection. And I knew that all of us are connected, that, that we there are no differences that separate us, no matter our, our region, uh, uh, where we live, what country, what religion we think we practice, what our politics are. Uh, nothing separates us. We are all connected. We are part of this great, wonderful thing called life. And so that to me was my game changer, knowing that I was connected to all of life and that uh, I was going to be this cheerleader for, for life for the rest of my life. And so that to me was a game changing moment. And speaking of community and being connected, you are a big advocate of highlighting and using your platform to help underprivileged uh, you know, causes, uh, especially in the Humane Society. You're a big fan of that and helping animals. Tell me a little bit about that connection there. So um, I've always been a big animal lover and uh, I, I had dogs and um, I lost my female dog and, and it was the most devastating day of my life. Um, and I put that right up there with losing relatives. Uh, my wow. heart was broken. I never thought I was ever going to um, come back from that. And I made a vow at that time. I still had a second dog um, that when the second dog died, I, I didn't want to go through that pain ever again. And uh, two years after she died, um, I was at Channel 7 and a photographer was out doing a story in Homestead and they found this abandoned puppy who was very sick and very skinny and very malnourished. And she brought the puppy back into uh, the Channel 7 studios and everybody was fawning all, all over the dog. Isn't it cute? And I carried the puppy and she took the puppy home to nurse it back to health. And she came back to the studio two days later with the puppy in tears, bawling that her landlady found out she had this puppy and was threatening to evict her and then she got rid of the dog and she didn't want to take the dog to the shelter but nobody was stepping up nobody was saying and because she was literally going to leave the studio and go to a shelter and drop off the dog and said give me the wow. puppy. i'm going to take the puppy and together all of us collectively are going to find this dog a forever home that was 12 <laughs> years ago i'm still fostering <laughs> this dog that dog changed my life that little scrawny little puppy changed my life it changed my outlook i got so much love out of showing her love and changing her life that to me there was no question that whenever i got another dog i was going to rescue that dog because she showed me the gift of 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 rescuing her and in turn she rescued me back right back because she completely changed my priorities in life my priority then became how do i give this dog the best life possible as a matter of fact i named her riley because i wanted to give her the life of riley I mean, that dog has been flying, <laughs> flies for, she flies in airplanes, she stays in fancy hotels, she eats room service. I mean, this little dog, this scrawny little dog that was abandoned and near death in Homestead is now, you know, swimming in the ocean every single day, you know? And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I love the fact that I changed this dog's life. That made me uh, an advocate for organizations that, uh, that advocate for abandoned uh, and homeless pets, uh, not just dogs and cats, but, all companion animals, uh, you know, horses and pot belly pigs and, and parrots, um, not the exotics, because I don't think that exotics have any place in our in our homes. And hopefully right. uh, that will resonate now. The Tiger King was the worst thing to happen to the exotic <laughs> animal trade, as far as I'm concerned. But I also advocate for a lot of the animals that 
um, that I met when I was on, you know, on my game drives in Africa. I, I, I advocate for the Sheldrick, you know, um, elephant sanctuary and uh, for the rhino sanctuary uh, where I was uh, in, in, uh, in Kenya. And so um, uh, there's a lot that I do. Uh, and, and obviously for the planet, I'm, a lot, I'm involved in many uh, environmental groups uh, such as Surfrider and Miami Waterkeeper and Sachamama, things that draw attention to the fact that we have to take care of our planet and, and really change our way of life and, and, and make adjustments in our lives so that we can preserve what we have for generations to come. It's a beautiful story. Louis, you're, a, you're an inspiration to many people. Uh, you've impacted oh, thank you. thousands, my friend. You definitely are a game changer. And you're an icon, not only in the South Florida community. <laughs> but well, thank you for saying that. You got it, brother. Hey, thank you so much for being on and sharing your story with us. Yeah. And we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year 2020. You know, listen, it still has gifts to give us. We have a couple of days left. And then 2021 is going to be amazing for all of us. Uh, love and peace, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thanks, brother. Thanks. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable, so I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it. You may end up being the game changer in their lives. <laughs>